cigarettes are <coughs> sorry about that that is uh, quite enough of that but I hoped you packed your bags last night pre-flight because today we're talking about good old Billiam Shatner and I'm gonna be high Billiam Invasion Iowa is a 2005 reality hoax show set in Riverside, Iowa, a small town that billed itself as the future birthplace of Captain Kirk to create a small tourist economy of mainly Trekkies. Cause Shakari knows that Trekkies like to buy everything. Invasion Iowa focuses on the future star of a TV series based on a Twitter account and Captain Kirk himself, William Shatner, coming to Riverside to direct and star in a low-budget B-movie that's full of lazy sci-fi cliches destined to end up in a Walmart DVD bargain bin. But of course, that's not what's actually going on, because William Shatner, director and star of 2002's Groom Lake, would never actually make a horrible sci-fi B-movie. The movie was a fake, and the cameras were actually filming the reaction of the townspeople of Riverside, some of whom were hired as cast and crew on the film, to the over-the-top antics of Shatner and his cohorts playing his zany compatriots. Mr. Shatner wanted three cue cards for the word no. no. One Mississippi, two Mississippi, three Mississippi, four Mississippi, five Mississippi, six Mississippi. I had actually filed this show away as a fever dream that I had right next to Stan Lee's Who Wants to Be a Superhero. Welcome to what will become the adventure of a lifetime. Excelsior! So, Aronok, my co-writer, and I recently sat down to make a fun, low-effort video about the show as we spent more time working on larger projects. Have you given up on sex? Is that what you're telling me? <laughs> what? What? <laughs> <laughs> Shit, you're hitting on these ladies? I love it. I love that for them. <laughs> well, ladies, you can't give up on that. But despite its seeming frivolity, Invasion Iowa actually led us to a much more extensive discussion on celebrity culture, abuse of power, and American class divides. Because everything has to be about capitalism, right? Everything does have to be about capitalism. Can we all do something about the smell? I know some people were complaining about the smell. Well, some of us don't like it either, but that's the economy around here. If we look beyond Invasion Iowa's forgettable surface, there lies a much deeper story. One that confronts us with more questions than the show ever intended to ask. How does a man like Shatner, who built a career on a series that inspired a look towards a more connected future, end up making a show that ignores the very humanity required to build that future? And what does that say about those who made it, those who were tricked by it, and those of us who watched it? Despite being trend-chasing schlock of the early 2000s, like Shatner as a cultural figure himself, Invasion Iowa is just self-aware enough to think the joke is on itself, but is consistently unaware of the perverse disdain, contempt, and fetishization it exudes for the everyday people whose adoration and trust were required to make it possible in the first place. I still can't believe that I spent the day with Willem Shatner, never had it acting gig before. Invasion Iowa asks us to point and laugh at the townspeople of Riverside even as the show unintentionally reveals their humanity and unmasks the condescending superiority complex of figures like Shatner and perhaps ourselves. start talking about William Shatner's ego, <clears throat> let's quickly stoke mine. 
I'll be talking more about this later in the video, but for those of you who don't know, I recently wrote and directed a sci-fi movie called Identities. Without giving away some of the fun secrets we have in store, it's basically Severance meets The Matrix meets Star Trek, while also being incredibly revolutionary and queer. And also because it's me being really, really weird as well. And since we're talking about Star Trek, I should also mention that it stars Q himself, the great John Delancey, who, by the way, is absolutely one of the loveliest humans I've worked with. But he's not the only one because we've also got Jessica Nicole from Fringe, Maggie Mae Fish from here on YouTube, RuPaul Drag Race's Jackie Cox, and Abigail Thorne of Philosophy Tube all in this movie. I am so excited to bring it all to you later this year, and it's been a real treat and honor to make something that I think is going to be truly special, especially because of the amazing cast and crew of mostly women, queer, and trans folks working on it. And what makes it even more special is that it was all made possible by Nebula. Nebula is a streaming service made so that creators like Abigail Thorne, FD Signifier, and so many others like myself can make work that speaks to our hearts without the worry of the YouTube algorithm. So many of your favorite creators, hopefully myself included, have exclusive content and early videos over on Nebula. Not only that, but Nebula has been working to develop some truly exceptional original content, such as identities. If you sign up now, you're not only going to get identities when it comes out, but also Abigail Thorne's horror comedy movie, Dracula's Ex-Girlfriend, when it comes out later this year as well. But also Nebula is full of original content on there right at this moment, including Abigail Thorne's The Prince, a trans-focused sci-fi Shakespeare multiverse play. There's also Patrick Willem's Star Wars Holiday Special, Maggie Mae Fish's amazing deep dive series Unrated, Lindsay Ellis's exclusive new video essays, amongst so much more. And there's a ton of stuff that's coming that we haven't even announced yet. Believe me, we've got some amazing things cooking. But most importantly, Nebula is enabling me and so many artists to create unique work, especially for those of us who don't always get a chance on YouTube or in Hollywood because of who we are. I'll be sharing more about my experience with identities in just a little bit, but if you use the link below, you can learn more about the film right now and sign up for Nebula to get access to all of our content, including identities, while also helping me pay my bills and funding future projects for myself and others. But with all of that said, Let's get back to good old Billiam Shatner. Why am I calling him that? This isn't like a joke with a payoff. I earnestly don't know why I'm calling him that. That's not even in my script. Invasion Iowa came out in the era of popular prank shows like Punked or 2003's The Joe Schmo Show, often mean-spirited series meant to provoke embarrassing moments from their prank victims. In fact, the producers of The Joe Schmo Show, future Zombieland, Deadpool, and Twisted Metal writers Reet Reese and Paul Wernick created Invasion Iowa after encountering William Shatner in an MTV lobby. So we were sitting in the MTV lobby and we saw our one of our heroes, William Shatner, in the lobby and we practically accosted you, if, I rem if I'm remembering right. I, I remember I ran a few steps. <laughs> Honestly, that's how I wish every TV show came into being, by cornering William Shatner until he agrees. The Joe Schmo Show is a clear spiritual precursor to Invasion Iowa. I'd highly recommend T1J's excellent video for a deeper analysis, but in summary, the series centered upon an everyday guy, Matt Gould, taking part in a Big Brother style reality game show where, unbeknownst to Matt, every other contestant was an actor playing out elaborate scripted sequences meant to elicit comedic reactions out of Matt. Kip discovered Hutch's ass in his memento book, and Matt lost it. Then what the fuck are you talking about, They're dude? They're a couple Polaroids! Hey, I'm sorry, I didn't think you'd freak out like this! And yes, that is Cricket from It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia. The problem, however, was the profoundly mean-spirited lens through which the show viewed Matt. Most of the pranks make Matt the butt of the joke, pushing him to do something embarrassing or placing him in stressful situations, so that we, the audience, can point and laugh at how ridiculous he is. You can give it some rhythm. Ha 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 I really wanted him to make noise, like make a sound. I don't know, I just thought it would be funny. I'm sorry, man. <laughs> and yes, that is Kristen Wiig. Even the title, Joe Schmo, has a pretentious scorn for Matt's seeming average nature. He's unimportant, thus he can be dehumanized and mocked. Hey, isn't this guy an idiot who we're all clearly, clearly better than? Is the tacit perspective the producers present as the given viewpoint of the series. 
Wyatt and Reese try to involve us, the viewers, in their implicit sense of superiority through their ridicule. But this assumption cuts against the truth of who our schmo, Matt, actually is. You don't feel at all bad that you might hurt her feelings or something like that? Dude, let me just I mean, say this. I'm just saying at all. Okay. Multiple orgasms. I, ain't, I, I didn't make her feel bad at all, trust me. Reality TV, which masquerades as an authentic reflection of life, is anything but genuine. Rather, it often thrives on contrived narratives and promotes self-absorbed behavior. Reality shows intentionally seek out individuals who are willing to play into the ego-driven nature of the premise, turning what could be real-life situations into orchestrated spectacles, which ultimately makes it not much different than actual fictional television or movies. But when we watch these shows, we're all buying into the performative nature of the world that it sets up. Joe Schmo, though, does something different. Reese and Wernick specifically cast Matt because he wasn't aware of the manufactured narrative that his peers were in on, nor actively incentivized to be self-centered, but placed him within a false reality that did, in fact, play by those rules, cynically assuming that Matt would actually behave in alignment with it. I kind of didn't know what to say, actually. I'm like, should I agree to this, or...? But yeah, so I, Hutch would agree and uh, maybe backstab him later. And ultimately, they were wrong. Matt showed himself to be a genuine stand-up guy, empathizing with the self-centered characters around him. Matt just turned his back out of respect for, you know, this relationship. He turned his back so we could talk to each other. I'm not doing anything wrong. But the show had been set up to treat Matt with the callous disregard they expected him to treat others with, and thus displayed constant cruelty to him by treating him like a fictional character to be milked for drama. It got so bad that at one point, Matt broke down on camera after Wyatt and Reese made it appear that the entire cast betrayed him by voting out a man who had become a father figure to Matt. Dude, nothing is worth this. No amount of money. Oh, I put yourself through this. It's stupid. For what? Matt's clearly distraught emotions led the cast to question the ethics of the situation, because they were also human beings as well and had empathy for him, leading to a complete tonal shift for the second half of the series. Suddenly, the show became about making Matt look good rather than trying to make him the butt of the joke. If they had continued in the direction the show had started with, it would have revealed the dehumanizing cruelty inherent to the series' conceptual assumptions in a way Wyatt and Reese weren't ready to self-analyze. And this may be why their sequel series, Invasion Iowa, tries to take a different tact with the target of its joke. Enter the man who once won an Emmy for playing James Spader's TV lover, William Shatner. We may not have sex, but ours is an affair of the heart. And we do spoon well. Boston Legal references, anyone? Is, is the internet ready for those yet? Are we as a culture ready for those yet? The whole premise of Invasion Io rests on the concept of a larger-than-life celebrity, in this case William Shatner, coming to a small town and acting like the self-important person that we all expect him to be. We spent months writing, rehearsing for uh, our invasion of Riverside, Iowa, and it, we were bringing a fake movie with fake characters to real people. We were actors playing to an audience that didn't know they were watching a show. It's about Hollywood coming down from its ivory tower to the real America, and being precisely the celebrity stereotype for the townsfolk there. And that's how Wernick and Reese repeatedly talked about the show. You know, William Shatner, their hero, comes to this small town. They don't have any sort of idea other than this has got to be real. I always sort of, people always say, you know, I challenge people to say, you put yourself in their position. There's no way you sniff anything outrageous going on. Instead of some schmo being the butt of the joke, it's William Shatner, a willing participant in the joke. First of all, yes. Mr. Shatner, I wanted to say welcome home. Welcome home. <laughs> yes. The characters, played by actors, that Shatner brings with him to make his fake movie complement Shatner being the source of ridicule. Kirk Ward as Tiny, my insane body double. Ernie Grunwald as Steve, my kooky spiritual advisor. Garz Chan as Max, my evil studio executive. And me, William Shatner, as the eccentric star. 
The idea of William Shatner having such a big ego that he has a young, sexy body double despite his age. Hey, you've been working out lately? I mean, you're my body double. You're supposed to have. I work <laughs> Supposed to have abs. Or that he has a stereotypical spiritual guru that everyone in Hollywood is supposed to have, fits perfectly within making fun of Shatner himself and the Hollywood glitz and glam. And the pilot episode starts with this framing in mind. After announcing his movie to the town, Shatner visits a small diner to get to know the people. But as he chants, he slowly starts eating from a man's plate and even goes so far as to eat his burger, as if he's entitled to the man's food by virtue of being William Shatner. Yes, it is a mean joke, but it's ultimately making fun of Shatner. Throughout the show, Shatner shows off his Emmy in casual conversations and constantly name drops Priceline.com, a brand that he was a well-known spokesperson for, when we all know he should have been promoting Kayak.com. Go use Kayak.com. Kayak.com, I'm not actually, I'm not actually being paid to promote Kayak.com, it's just the thing that I use to get my, my flights. It, it works pretty, pretty well. I don't give a shit what you used, use whatever works for you. Another good bit has Shatner jokingly start a petition to rename Riverside after himself to Billsville. Listen, Bill, Bill, Bill Pope, come over here a second. I wanna bring up the idea to change the name of Riverside to Billville. Then one of the fake casts attempts to do so in order to surprise William Shatner and make him like him more. I'm talking to Jim Pickering and I want to do something special for my uncle, and I want to make a Billville sign. A good parody of how celebrity egos get stoked and fed. Welcome to Billville, home of Emmy Award winning William Shatner. We're changing the town name, official, well, unofficially right now, but is that a cop? Shatner also does an intentionally terrible stand-up routine, and no one is willing to tell him it's bad because he's a celebrity. What crazy celebrity? would be complete without a bad stand-up comedy routine. I'm not saying Father Rich's sermons are boring, but about 20 minutes I was like, beam me up, Jesus. <laughs> Whoa! Oops. Yeah. There's also the time that Shatner gave all of his cast and crew Shatner-branded hats to wear called Shats. But they're not hats, they're Shats. All of these jokes are Shatner actively choosing to be the subject of mockery. What? Yes, I shat myself. What of it? I'm a Trekkie. You thought I wouldn't buy the merchandise? I may want to live in a post-scarcity, moneyless society, but I still want the merch. I'm a bad anarchist. So all of this is playing up the idea that Shatner is more focused on building up himself or making money than he is being a human being or making art. The movie, which Shatner screens scenes from every night, is horrible, but no one wants to tell him because he's William Shatner. We watch as everyone awkwardly tries to hide their laughter at how bad it is. She's been sent to take you back to the Emperor for your impregnation. There is one way to ensure the success of your mission. It's a show that centralizes its humor around celebrity ego and our often inability to honestly wrestle with the power that it gives and thus the isolation that power causes. Unlike the Joe Schmo show, which placed an everyday man in a fake reality, Invasion Iowa tries to interrogate the fake reality that celebrities find themselves within every day. The show's awareness of this is evident in its selection of Riverside as the prank's location, because it's where Shatner's iconic status is not just celebrated as it would be everywhere else, but also economically crucial. As the birthplace of Captain Kirk, the town relies again on Trekkie tourism, giving Shatner a unique influence tied to both goodwill and the town's economic prospects that he wouldn't get anywhere else. He also has power on an individual level even beyond celebrity. Shatner is casting citizens of Riverside for his movie. He has the power to give people a chance at the gateway to a career that they might never have had otherwise in that town. The dream of making movies and art that many don't have because they can't all live in Hollywood or New York City. And it's this self-awareness of that power that makes the show's abuse of it, as they move beyond making fun of Shatner, so much more disturbing.
Shatner holds auditions to find candidates to cast in his fake movie and be the prank's unknowing central figures. Throughout the process, the edit lingers on bad auditions, asking us to chuckle at people who never thought their audition footage would be used publicly. Shatner and company wield their power to push auditioners into performing embarrassing acts that make them clearly uncomfortable so that we can mock them. Dance, hey, go, go man, go, go, go. The show is looking down on people for trying to do something new by people who ask them to do it. At one point during the process, we meet Billy, who auditions for the street punk who gets killed by the Terminator in the first five minutes of the film. And Billy is actually really good, especially for a dude who hasn't been in a film before. Something funny? What? You heard me, loser. Kirk Ward, who plays Shatner's body double character, reacts to Billy this way, though. This guy got right up in my kitchen, and I could smell his coffee, his cigarettes, and the last four meals he'd had. And you could just tell when he came in, he was like, this is my dream. Ward frames Billy to us as this guy who's trying too hard and thinks he will make it big. The show is then asking us, the audience, to view Billy as a terrible actor who we should ridicule, not just for his acting ability, but for thinking he could ever have worth as an actor in the first place. There's this undercurrent of scorn for his ability and aspirations. This also reveals the cruelty of the fact that the movie that they're auditioning for isn't real. It's an intentionally lousy script, as Shatner himself intonates. The screenplay is terrible, and it's an amalgamation of all those science fiction movies, The Terminator, Star Trek. The people of Riverside think they're being given a chance to show their untapped talent that has so long been laying dormant by a man who they respect, and who they think respects them. When in truth, they, and thereby we as the audience, are just there to make fun of them thinking that they were ever worth being given an opportunity in the first place. I think this movie will bring Riverside into the forefront of, of the country. I don't remember you asking me if you could take Linda on a date. Do it again and do it with a Cajun accent. A date? Man, I don't remember you asking me if you could take Linda on a date, huh? The show actively tries to interrogate the power of celebrity culture, but Wyatt, Reese, and Shatner and the rest all remain willfully ignorant of their implicit sense of superiority over those they see as ordinary, unimportant people because they don't come from Hollywood. The show's premise presupposes that the people of Riverside, Iowa are lesser, less important, less valuable, and less capable. Every compliment they give is backhanded. Compare this to the recent 2023 show, Jury Duty. Basically the Joe Schmo show, but with a courtroom twist. Ronald is assigned to Jury Duty, but doesn't know that everyone is an actor. But at the same time, I'm having a good time. I mean, these are great people. Like Ross said, I've, I've, I would never hang out with a handful of these people, but having been forced to, it's, it's nice, you know? You just get to meet new people. Ronald is never put into situations where he is the butt of the joke, or made to look embarrassing for our amusement. Instead, we're mostly watching a mid-quality network sitcom in the style of Parks and Recreation or Abbott Elementary that just happens to have a real dude in the middle of it all. How are you that psychic? Because this happens every day, Barb. This, <laughs> there has not been a single day that we've had that's just been smooth. There's always something crazy that comes up. <laughs> this is, literally feels like reality TV. Oh. Instead of cutting away to the actors laughing at how hilarious or stressful the situations for Ronald are, they never actually break character, even in the interviews. I'm fine not being for a person, and Ronald and I have actually just started discussing the possibility of me being his assistant, so it's good. <laughs> The show itself never breaks the fourth wall of the situation outside of its opening titles, where it tells us that Ronald is a real guy, allowing us as the audience to fully invest in the scenario and identify with Ronald himself. Sir. I'm, I'm, I also am uh, racist. Sir, please have a seat. I'm sorry, you're a racist? I did not think Noah would run with it, but he definitely gave it a shot, <laughs> and it did not work out for him. Similar to Shatner in Invasion Iowa, James Marsden plays a heightened, self-absorbed version of himself. I'm supposed to be getting the Lone Pine script soon, and that's gonna require my full undivided attention, so I wouldn't even have the bandwidth <laughs> to deal with all of this. Lone Pine's the name of the movie, by the way, in case anyone's confused. Who would've thought the guy who played Cyclops would ever have that big of an ego? 
Marsden never puts Ronald in a situation where Ronald looks bad, but ensures the joke is always on Marsden himself or other consenting actors in the scene. Tell me that Ben Schwartz was the voice of Sonic. Oh, yeah, I, 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 I you know, kind of forget about him sometimes. I thought you was hilarious. I have to apologize to the guy, man. I, that's exactly what I have to do. I told him I heard it was a shit movie, so. When the actors reveal themselves at this show's end, the series takes a whole episode to showcase how they worked to ensure that Ronald was never in compromising situations. Man, that, it sucks that this was like staged because man, you have no idea how many people I was gonna tell about that. <laughs> you have no idea, man. <laughs> James Marsden went down there and jumped on a bed so that they could have sex that's not sex. <laughs> While the entire premise of jury duty remains ethically dubious, it never actually works to belittle its subject. Ronald is not someone to laugh at, but a surrogate for us as viewers to empathize with, laughing along with him at the ridiculousness of the situation, allowing for a truly heartwarming, graceful show. Because I liked the people that I got yeah. to know. Yeah. 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 You know? So. We're good actors. We're not that good. 90% yeah. 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 of what you saw is really a it's part of us. So yeah, here's the deal. We all fell in love with you. Invasion Iowa, in contrast, constantly tries to get us to laugh at the people of Riverside in the scenarios that Wyatt, Reese, and Shatner set up. Take, for example, how they have one of the Riverside actors, Wayne, say the word hogwash as part of their script. In the time card thing, they didn't help me out a bit because she couldn't be in the spot where I could see her. It's lying. Uh, I've never heard such hogwash. Beans and corn grown in the sky, I've never heard such hogwash. Which the show then cuts back to in every single episode to basically say, look at the way this hick talks, isn't it funny? I've never heard such hogwash. Will they continue to be fooled? Find out tonight. But it's the line that they wrote for him to say. And being frank, he's not that bad of an actor. He's supposed to be playing a hick farmer in the scene. The show does this over and over and over again, creating scenarios where we're meant to laugh at the people of Riverside despite those moments being created by the show itself, revealing just an utter disdain for everyone involved. That's it, Scotty, that's it. Just being involved has just been amazing. It's been a privilege just being asked to work on it. On his ass, Scotty. Yes. And that disdain reveals itself for me in a moment when the actor playing the spiritual guru says the name of the mayor of the town. Mayor Pope, or as I like to call him, Mayor Pugh. You can just hear the smug sense of superiority dripping from how he says it. Pugh. I'm not gonna lie, I had an incredibly visceral reaction to that moment when Aronach and I watched this show. I like to call him Mayor Pugh. I'm sorry, what? Fuck this man. I call him Mayor Pugh. Like making fun of this man's last name. Go fuck yourself. That bit right, that moment right there, pissed me off more than anything else that I've seen so far. Like, there's worse things that have happened, but that moment was just so blatant, like, holier than thou There's bullshit. just a degree of resentment, or, or yeah. I don't even know. It, just, it was just mean. Yeah, that it was, was just mean. a very, the entire way that that dude just said that was very mean. That moment is just so symbolic of the series' constant, mean-spirited, condescending attitude. The editing is particularly egregious in reinforcing this. At one point, Shatner gets Scotty, a townie hired as an on-set producer, to form Shatner's over-the-top hype-up routine that Shatner himself faked making with his guru. Really? A light! And the light! Give, it, it, give it a light! Yes! And the light! Smite you! Step in my way, way, I'll, way, I'll you. smite you! Smite you! Smite you. This clip of Scotty embarrassing himself at Shatner's provocation is then played as the end credits for every episode after that without context, asking us at the end of every show to laugh at Scotty's humiliation. At one point, Shatner needs a scream sound effect for a scene, so he has the townspeople perform squealing, and the mayor of Riverside makes an honestly really great sound effect. <laughs> which the show then constantly cuts to over and over and over again. Are you crazy? <laughs> the edit is deliberately dehumanizing these people by taking moments of their life out of context for us to laugh at. We are meant to see these people as silly and ridiculous. And as this happens, the joke slowly but surely drifts away from Shatner and over to the people of Riverside.
In many ways, the whole series is kind of a microcosm of William Shatner himself. Shatner has made an undeniable cultural footprint as Captain Kirk, as well as having numerous other decently well-known roles throughout his career, becoming one of the few people that almost everyone in America and Canada knows. But his ego and self-entitlement are nearly as well-known as he is. Back in the 1960s on Star Trek, after Leonard Nimoy's iconic character of Spock took off, Shatner began to demand to be in more scenes, as well as took lines from other actors on the set. He's a charming guy, and when you first meet him, you know, he will sweet talk y'all. But every one of us have had problems with him. He and Leonard had a lot of uh, tension going between them. TV Guide was doing a photo essay on Leonard Nimoy becoming Mr. Spock, the process of getting the makeup on. And then uh, half an hour later, Bill comes in and sees what's going on. He turns on his heel, gets to a, a phone on the set, and shortly a minion comes over and uh, dismisses the photographer. What? Apparently, Bill had written into his contract photographer approval on the soundstage. He exercised. Gene Roddenberry, the creator of Star Trek, even wrote a long, scathing letter to Shatner admonishing him for his behavior during the filming of season one of the series, where he remarked on how the reality of Shatner's real-life actions were beginning to bleed into the character, blurring the line between reality and fiction. I want you to realize fully where your fight for absolute screen dominance is taking you. It's already affecting the image of Captain Kirk on the screen. We're heading for an arrogant, loud, half-assed Queeg character who is so blatantly insecure about that screen that he can't afford to let anyone else have an idea, give an order, or solve a problem. You can't hide things like that from an audience. Damn, Gene. <laughs> All of this led to Shatner having lifelong feuds with George Takei and on-again, off-again arguments with Nimoy himself. And Shatner's ego-driven nature continued throughout his career, as seen in his using his contract to ensure that he got to direct Star Trek V after Leonard Nimoy got to direct Star Trek III and IV. In his later years, though, Shatner became self-aware of his vanity, or at least aware that it was part of his public persona. He began playing into the joke by constantly making fun of his overacting, his willingness to promote products like Priceline, and laughing at the times where people called him out on his ego. When I directed Star Trek IV, I got a magnificent performance out of Bill because I respected him so much. And when I directed Star Trek V, I got a magnificent performance out of me because I respected me so much. This self-parody aspect actually fits really well with Shatner's persona as an actor. There have been a ton of jokes about Shatner's overacting over the years, but it's also part of what makes him so enjoyable to watch, especially when he's placed next to more emotionally contained actors like James Spader or Leonard Nimoy. That dichotomy, by the way, along with Shatner's queer-friendly camp acting style, is also partially why so many of his characters end up the subject of queer shipping online. But his over-the-top acting is ripe for allowing Shatner to get in on his own joke, laughing at himself. I'm just a sexy boy. But even still, his ego and sense of entitlement remain. Hell, the week that I'm writing this, Shatner gave old man yelling at clouds vibes on the artist formerly known as Twitter, complaining about how Star Trek didn't include him in a promotional banner and how it must mean that modern Trek's creators are afraid of him and trying to erase the past. Extreme, I'm not mad, you're mad, and the woke are coming to get me vibes. To be fair, these tweets could have just been Shatner's social media manager, but they are well in line with Shatner's more public comments about how things like Star Trek 2009 should have included him and not just Nimoy because he was the quote, founding father of Star Trek. He acts as if he's entitled to Star Trek, as if he's the entire reason that Star Trek was built, despite the fact that Star Trek has long moved beyond him, as most things should move beyond us, as well as the fact that Star Trek's popularity was the result of numerous people working together, such as Gene Roddenberry, Gene Kuhn, Leonard Nimoy, Nichelle Nichols, DC Fontana, and Shatner himself, as well as numerous others, perhaps the most important of which is the numerous fans who fell in love with Star Trek and the work the artists on it made, and worked to continue to preserve it despite it being cancelled after only three seasons in its initial run, leading to the entire franchise that we have now. Shatner's celebrity is not just his own creation, but the creation of numerous other collaborators as well as the very fans who fell in love with and uplifted his work in the first place. The very adoration that Shatner continually takes advantage of. But it goes to his misunderstanding of Star Trek as a whole, because Shatner has talked about how he said that Star Trek was never woke, again giving Fox News vibes. 
Star Trek, if you can get past the admittedly very problematic, cynical corporate attempts to make it a franchise brand, is at its core a series owned by fans who believe in its philosophy of a better future that accepts all of us as equally worthwhile, unique human beings simply by the fact that we exist. It's infinite diversity and infinite combinations, as I have tattooed on my wrist. The glory of creation is in its infinite diversity. And the ways our differences combine to create meaning and beauty. This playing into his own ego as a joke ultimately still serves Shatner's ego. It makes him the center of attention. George Takei has spoken about this in recent years, how Shatner intentionally plays up his feuds with him or talks about his ego whenever he has a book to sell. When Bill has a book to sell, he needs publicity and accuses us of using him. Even his Twitter spats generate news articles about him even when there's no news to be had. If William Shatner had been born into my generation, he easily would have become a drama farming Twitch streamer with all the kerfuffles he likes to start. Chandler, though, is self-aware enough to know to make fun of himself for the camera, but also does nothing to actively break down that sense of self-importance and superiority. His self-awareness is simply hollow. This is also ironic given the context of where Invasion Iowa aired. Like the Joe Schmo Show, Invasion Iowa aired on Spike TV, which pitched itself as the first network for men. In a way, only early 2000s advertising campaigns fueled on pure testosterone could. <sighs> It's also the channel where everything had to revolve around women's boobs because being a man means dehumanizing women. Definitely the fun bags. I mean, I just love to bury my face in there and just go. <laughs> I say that jokingly, but in truth, the entire predicated nature of a society is built on the hierarchy of man versus woman. And so to be a man, at least in the sense of how our patriarchal society wishes to view it as, in the hierarchical dichotomy that we have set up, it means inherently viewing women as lesser and as objects to be pushed around, to be laughed at, scorned, or treated badly. Trigger warning here, I'm gonna show an image of Matt Walsh, but we can even see that in things like everyone's favorite Logan cosplayer and Daily Wire host, Matt Walsh, saying this exact thing recently on his show. But buying a Valentine's Day gift for your wife a month early is the gayest thing you could do. Don't do that, because if, you, if, if it's January 3rd and you tell your wife, I got you Valentine's Day gift already, she's gonna say, I, so you're gay. When I hear I thought the most gay thing you do was but the reason Matt says that without any hint of irony is because he views men and women within a power dichotomy. And thus, if you are nice to your wife, if you treat her as a human being, as an equal, you are inherently less of a man because you are lowering yourself on the power hierarchy and power is all that matters for being a man. And we can see this clearly throughout Spike TV in the way it dehumanized women in order to be the manly channel for men. It showcases how we dehumanize people through the power dynamic and how we're all told to perform those power dynamics lest we seem to be not fitting into the role that we're told to play. And if all of that made sense to you, then congratulations, I've just given you a primer on Judith Butler's basic premise of the performative nature of gender. Huzzah, gender shit, you knew I was gonna, you knew I was gonna get it in there, I had to, I had to. But as a kid, I actually watched Spike TV because despite its manly man nature having the clear opposite effect on me, Spike TV also aired reruns of The Next Generation and Deep Space Nine, which they always sold as a super badass dude show. How is this possible? What you think you've seen hasn't happened yet. Trek, uncut. Two hours of Trek the way it was meant to be seen. Uncut. Uncut? What do you mean uncut? There's no uncut episodes of Star Trek. I mean, I wish we had some hard R scenes of Kirk and Spock fucking. But alas, we're not going to. Hallelujah. But the promos on Spike TV just say uncut because it appears like you'll get a badass episode from the series starring candy-colored pajama-wearing Frenchmen who chat in conference rooms all day. You know, manly men. Spike TV is clearly missing the empathy that is central to Star Trek's ethos, removing Star Trek from its context in order to try to play it up as a manly man show. So for all of these reasons, Invasion Iowa is a perfect fit, given that it stars William Shatner and actively looks down on the people that it's not marketing to to make money from. And you can see this dehumanization in Invasion Iowa's promos. And before I play this, just, I need to say, there is a lot happening in this promo. You just, 
You just gotta let it wash over you. The farmer, the housewife, the mayor, the town, the punk, the priest, and everyone around. They were all pawns in my wicked plot to fake shooting a movie when we're really not. Mm -hmm. in the middle of the sticks. Invasion Iowa! Invasion Iowa! I tricked them! It's a phony sci-fi flick! Shatner, his guru, the stun! Correct! I know, I know, I told you it was a lot. Why are they stick puppets? Why is Shatner s singing? And why is there a cow at the bar? Correct! It was the early 2000s, and many of us did things that we all regret. But here how Shatner describes the people of Versailles as pawns and these real people as the farmer, the punk, and the mayor, as if they're just as much stock characters as the cast that Shatner brought with him to Iowa. They are not individuals to Shatner or the show's creators, they are objects and props for their own entertainment and profit. This is the key to understanding the whole problem with the series because we can see the prejudices Wyatt and Reese entered into this concept with. They came looking for the stereotype of the rural hick American and tailored everything that they scripted in advance for the show around that, assuming that that's who they'd find. At one point in the series, an actress playing a producer shows up and describes her character as a bitch. My job every day was just to, do, to, to go in and just be a bitch. The entire fake cast and crew act with contempt and fear around her. And after these moments, the edit then turns to highlight a random townsperson calling this woman a bitch. Translation, she could be a real bitch if she wanted to be. Yes. As if this sexist bigotry was expected from this small town guy. But Wyatt and Reese set up the scenario to cultivate that exact reaction. She's cast to play a bitch and says so herself. She's literally being a bitch, I don't know what to tell you. The show also forces this actress to play up Asian stereotypes, like when she mentions that Japanese people eat feces. Human beings in Japan freeze their turds and then they go out and sell it on the market. This was based on a racist hoax that was published in several newspapers around the time of the show, and was seemingly only mentioned to provoke a racist response, which no one from the town provides, thankfully. The show also plays further into sexism. Correct. In the fake film, Desi Lydak plays the Disintegratrix 3000, a Terminator ripoff in a discount 7 of 9 costume. But in the reality of Invasion Iowa, she's also playing the ditzy actress. Desi Lydak, because Griffin, my ditzy leading lady. And yes, that is Desi Lydak from The Daily Show. Does that one need to be called out? Does anyone still watch The Daily Show? I don't even think Comedy Central still watches The Daily Show. At one point, she keeps screwing up being able to say Disintegratrix in a scene with Billy, to which Shatner gets frustrated as she's wasting filming time. I'm the Disintegratrix. Sorry. I'm the Disintegratrix. Was that almost it? The Disintegratrix. Keep going. Disintegratrix. Great tricks 3000. The show is seemingly trying to get Billy to empathize with Shatner and get upset at the supposed professional screwing up by leaning into a sexist trope of the dumb sexy blonde. The producers assume that Billy is going to side with the power in the situation, with William Shatner. But Billy is a fucking champ because he is just patient and kind with Desi. I thought these guys were going to be laughing at me like, oh, this girl's cute, but she's kind of dumb. Disintegrate. Disintegrate. Tricks. Tricks. Disintegrate tricks. No, they were right there. They were, it's disintegrate tricks. It's really, it's a hard word to say. Just spell it out slowly. It's like a rhythm. Disintegrate tricks. Disintegrate tricks. Aranok and I, while watching this, fucking loved Billy. He's the goddamn best. See? Bill's nice. Mm -hmm. He's just legitimately nice. And, and notice that he isn't like participating in the making fun of her. He's just like, you know, she's clearly having a hard time. And I thought I was supposed to be the one that's being anxious. It's kind of funny. But like, he's not being like, ha dumb women. This is why I'm particularly upset that Billy is given this line in the Invasion Iowa promo. Correct. Billy, by the way, is also the only person in the entire series to almost figure out the hoax before William Shatner reveals it. With William Shatner, you never know what is going on. Bill Blank, he was more astute than anybody else, I think. This reveals how much empathy Billy has because he realizes that this entire situation does not feel real. Blank is the impact of, you know, it's just sometimes this seems so weird. It seems like maybe I feel like I'm on a reality show. If they say it's not right, it's not real, you're making fools of us, and I'm going to tell the town, we're dead. Now, long story short is we're going to get Bill gone, Bill Blank gone. This whole segment is also frustrating because it also shows that Desi has clear skill as an actress. 
At one point, she has to cross the road as the Terminator, I mean Disintegratrix 3000, and looks both ways before she crosses the street, which Desi, out of character, laughs at. That's the street, no cars, safe to go through. Basically, I can't be killed, I can't be hurt, but I could possibly be run over by a car. Even in a small moment that no one cares about or can even really see, Desi intentionally plays the wrong choice for more laughs, showing her attention to detail as a performer. So she's literally 7 of 9, someone brought in to the show for sex appeal, but much brighter than anyone gave her credit for. At least reason why it didn't have her boobs grow out Terminator 3 style. That said, there is a gag supposedly aimed at making fun of the sexism of sci-fi movies like Terminator 3, with a subtle joke that the cleavage on Desi's costume gets more prominent for absolutely no reason the longer the film goes on. Which could have been really funny. The first day it was pretty revealing. I didn't think it could get much worse, but somehow throughout the progression of the scenes, I had more and more cleavage. But the show just uses this as an excuse to take five whole minutes of a 22 minute episode to talk about Desi's boobs, and then cut to how everyone around Desi, including Shatner, her real life boss, are leering at her breasts. The sweetness of our girl Griffin is unimaginable. She's got this cute little mouth, these sweet eyes, this cute little face. This... <laughs> and uh, delicious uh, uh, figure. We don't even know if these shots are actually these people staring at her breasts, but the show edits these reactions to make it seem that way, portraying the men of Riverside and Shatner, the man in power here, as leering creepy men which also displays the heterosexual male gaze of this show and Spike TV as a whole. So like most of the show, it takes a self-aware joke, in this case about sexism, and then just unironically makes it into creepy sexism. Speaking of, the show has numerous jokes at the expense of Desi's breasts, such as when Desi reads the town a terrible children's book that she's supposedly writing, within which it's clear that the fake character she's playing is clearly just trying to justify having gotten artificial breasts. Why do penguins with big wings get everything they want? The vet said, don't you worry, you can have a bigger pair. I'll give you wings so perfect that everyone will stare. Not only are all of these jokes dehumanizing to Desi, it also is playing into the sexist idea that women who get breast implants are somehow fake or lying about their femininity. While also trying to give the show plausible deniability by making the folks of Riverside be the ones who say it, despite the show prompting it in the first place. I would prefer Popo the Penguin would not have artificial uh, wings. This, along with the racist and sexist humor directed at the fake producer of the fake movie, shows that the dehumanizing humor of the show is not just limited to the residents of Riverside, but to the women on Shatner's own crew. But this isn't even the end of all of this. In another episode, Desi again reads from the children's book, but this time showcases a page where the two girl penguins are clearly lesbians playing with dildos. The two gals soon became friends together with no boys. They spent all their time alone just playing with their toys. Now that's a march of the penguins that I'd watch. The show then cuts to Jim Pickering, an actual Riverside resident hired to be a fake product placement manager, who bemusedly points out the obvious, that those two penguins are clearly fucking each other. Did Nobody's you perfect. see the toys that Popo and her new friend had? Rockets. <laughs> rockets. Vibrating rockets, maybe? No. We're looking at a children's book, okay? okay. These are girl penguins, you know, I think dolls. this book is not just for men. These are girl penguins. But the show lingers on this scene with Pickering because the show is trying to get a homophobic response out of him. But Jim isn't being homophobic. He's picking up the queer coding that's only slightly less subtle than Garrick and Bashir. I'm so glad to have made such an interesting new friend today. So much of our media dehumanizes places like Riverside. We stereotype and expect them to all be bigots and idiots. And this is created from a sense of cultural superiority over them. That we're less backwards, more enlightened than them. When, in truth, I often see more subtle and more impactful bigotries towards the marginalized from my capital L liberal peers that I ever got in small town America like the places that I grew up in. 
Often trans people and other marginalized people will get tokenistic acceptance of our existence, but a lack of caring to hear our voices, or a desire to have us within their spaces. This is how you get Karens, people. White women who see black people in their space and will weaponize their womanhood in order to get state power, the police in order to get to push those marginalized people out. But because we use state power that has itself been made invisible, we tend to have this condescending smugness that we are better than the people of rural America, that our bigotries aren't existent. And it's this condescending smugness that conservative rhetoric gleefully plays off of, generating that us versus them mentality because we have so dehumanized each other. The liberal woke elite in Hollywood hate you. Conservative pundits and politicians then twist this mindset to equate queers, trans people, BIPOC, women, Jewish, Muslims, and other marginalized folks with the liberal elite because we are often put forth as tokenistic representation, left to fend for ourselves as the public face of these smug producers, politicians, and capitalists in power. All of this is how bigotries that uphold our society's power hierarchies get forged and perpetuated. It's why we're seeing so many harmful anti-trans laws get enacted based on the lie that trans people's existence is just the Hollywood woke mind virus causing a social contagion through sexualized queer representation in media for children. Transgender, it sounds so harmless. And it's made very, very cool through the media, through TikTok, through Reddit, through Tumblr, through Instagram, through Facebook, through Twitter, through their games, in their movies. Um, and all these corporations are involved in supporting this. So when I see Invasion Iowa exerting that liberal condescension while perpetuating harmful narratives around queer people to ask us as audience members to be complicit in their smug sense of superiority, I'm pissed off. All this dehumanization is playing off the presumed classist biases that White and Reese assume their audience shares with them. Compare this to Jury Duty, where Ronald is given moments that humanize him. For example, one fake juror, Todd, is artistically coded with a hyperfixation on cybernetics. His fixation and lack of social awareness disrupt the courtroom constantly, such as when he wears chair pants that he built. Uh, I have to I, uh, ha have an um, uh, attachment, a device that I can't sit in the chair. While I have issues with a fictional autistic character played by a non-autistic actor being used with the express purpose of creating comedic scenarios stemming from his autistic traits as it reveals an uninterrogated ableist bias in Jury Duty's writers, Ronald himself never looks down on Todd, but sees Todd as a whole human being, not as a character. So I showed him that movie to kind of let him know that you know, those people tend to be misunderstood in society. Just like it's portrayed in the movie, I feel like they do a perfect job. You know, he's kind of an outcast. People think he's a weirdo. They push him off to the side. And all he's trying to do is just help in his own way. When many would have insulted Todd or tried to distance themselves from him based on our cultural understanding of autistic people, based on the same ableist biases that the jury's duties writers are playing off of, instead, Ronald invites Todd into the group, asking him to play video games or watch movies with everyone else because Ronald is a person with empathy. The producers actively work to create and edit the show in a way that humanize Ronald by positively portraying him through his kindness to others. It's his empathy for others that cause Ronald to seem more real to us in the audience, because empathy and connection is what makes us human. It's sweet and endearing. Invasion Iowa, in contrast, doesn't know how to portray its subjects with any dignity. Take the scene where Shatner tries to convince a Riverside priest to let him destroy his priceless stained glass mirrors for the film. The show is trying to provoke the priest into getting upset at Shatner, but he just politely nods, placating Shatner's request. If I could break one of these windows... <laughs> You're kidding, aren't you? <laughs> you know, I, we'd have to look into it, but I'm not kidding. It's an awkward moment because the priest is trying to show kindness and humor Shatner, which then creates a lingering awkward atmosphere as Shatner continues to push the bit because he tries to play the priest as a character in his show. We'll think about it. I'll have to ask a few important people here in the Paris scene. Well, of course. It gets so bad that the show's editor has to keep cutting away to random shots to play the hallelujah sound effect because the show doesn't know what to do when it's not insulting their subjects. Wow, what a beautiful church. How long is it? been here. Hallelujah. You know we want to have a wedding in here. And the show does this type of editing nigh constantly, because otherwise there's no vibrancy on screen. You see one of those windows break. I'd like you to think about it. I mean, imagine if I tried to randomly cut away to random shit in my videos just to make it seem like I'm funny and hide my true awkwardness. Hallelujah. It would just be cheap and reveal the inherent meaninglessness of my work that I live in constant anxiety of you all one day discovering and 
leaving me forever unobserved, proving that my existence is a futile endeavor if I'm not being watched constantly, soon to be lost in the ever-flowing river of time. It goes like this, the fourth, the fifth, the minor fall, and the major lift, the baffled king composing, hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Also, quick aside here, this show's use of terrible stock music is painful. <music> Invasion Iowa doesn't even dehumanize just the main subject of the show, but the entire town. There's one moment where Shatner films a terrible fight scene with Riverside citizens acting as extras, who all react to the scene, you know, like film extras are supposed to do. But apparently, we're supposed to find them doing their jobs ridiculous and hilarious. One woman was just going, <gasps> It felt great to be a professional extra today. It was a lot of fun. It's a bad scene, sure, but believe me, I've been an extra on worse. I just want to thank everyone for coming to this uh, special day. I, I can't wait to speak. All of this speaks to the power dynamic here. There are people doing a job while unknowingly being mocked for their work. The townspeople of Riverside trust they'll be treated with respect by an artist they respect, but they're just treated like tools to be laughed at. And we, the audience, are treated as idiots too, as if we can't understand that these people are doing a job. The only moments where the show gets a sincere laugh from me are the simple moments with the people of Riverside having earnest fun. Like when Jim jumps into a shot to jokingly promote a product. Okay, let's go. Right. It's so sweet and genuine that it reminds me of watching the blooper reels of the better Captain Kirk on the set of Star Trek 2009. Oh yeah, I said it. Bite me, Trekkies. Bite me. I mean, hell, the townspeople even wear the shats that Shatner gave them because they thought it was a nice gift, and they look really sweet in them. Even these cynical jokes come off as genuine because these people really care. The Emmy does it live. William Shatner is Television Academy approved. <laughs> The Riverside residents are just kind, caring people whose humanity shines through because they are empathetic, despite the attempts by Wyatt and Reese to reduce them to callous stereotype, right down to the dehumanizing, out-of-context way that they're edited. Which makes what I have to talk about next the fucking worst. Until now, everything I've discussed is nothing too unusual for a mid-2000s prank TV show, outside of its celebrity focus and cheap sci-fi sheen. But we actually haven't talked much about the fake movie's production, and that's because it's fucking awful. Some of the movie set pranks are focused solely on the film being a terrible B-movie. At one point, they lather Shatner up in embryonic fluid meant to look like, well, um, let's just say it's unbecoming. Get it? Be. Coming. Because it's a B-movie. And it looks like semen! Despite Shatner looking like me on a Friday night, it's lazy, crude humor that yes, I can get into from time to time, but is ultimately just emblematic of Spike TV at the time. Yeah. Uncle Bill, okay. I haven't seen a load like this in a while. Oh, stop. <laughs> but the larger problem is that most of the pranks are Shatner, Wyatt, and Reese creating intentionally a toxic, unsafe work environment. On the day the bitch producer arrives, Shatner tells Scotty to keep Kirk Ward and Desi away from each other so they don't end up dating and ruin things in front of the producer. Keep an eye on Tony and report back to me what's happening. Okay. But then Kirk and Desi intentionally leave set to go fake flirt, forcing Scotty to go find them and pick them up. What? Nobody needs to be babysitting you today. Oh. At the very least, Scotty has none of their excuses. That's your cover. I'm not babysitting today. Seriously, fucking go off, Scotty. 
But what this is doing is placing Scotty in a stressful situation where he believes that he's trying to keep a set from falling apart in front of a demanding producer. He feels that he has the responsibility for protecting everyone on that set's jobs because these two idiots are going to fuck off. We gotta get him back because otherwise Mr. Shatner's gonna go through the roof. Another scene has Shatner yelling at his body double for messing around on set during a climactic church scene, making all the extras uncomfortable with Shatner's berating directing style and unprofessional behavior towards the cast. Worse, even the fake actors in on the prank are placed into dangerous situations, like when Wayne hits Kirk Ward on the back with a shovel because they don't have stunt coordinators. Which is something even on a fake movie set you should have for the safety of everyone there. Homie hit me in the shoulder blade like, you know, I was a chicken with rabies that he just had to murder. Wayne's not trained nor knows better because he's not a professional actor with set or stunt experience. Ward could have gotten seriously hurt and it would not have been Wayne's fault. Yet despite this happening on the first day of filming, so they could have taken precautions to prevent it from happening in the future, it happens again to Desi later on. And it could not have been any harder. Ooh. I kind of stood there for a minute. I couldn't believe how much it really hurt and how real it felt. There's also a bit where Shatner, as director, repeatedly forces Ward to run endlessly in the hot sun, dehydrating and overworking him, so as to humorously make it look like Shatner is abusing his power over the man in front of the rest of Riverside by, you know, actually abusing the poor man in front of the rest of Riverside. Yeah, hey. Hot. Some water for Tiny. <laughs> Give him a cigar. Tiny? How does Tiny feel? I don't think Tiny should smoke. Tiny feels tiny. You don't think Tiny should smoke a cigar? <laughs> smoke a cigar. I think it's okay. Camacho. You feel sexy? The show also creates toxic situations outside of Shatner, such as how Shatner's fake assistant clearly plays that he's scared of the quote-unquote bitch producer's anger in front of the Riverside residence, generating an air of fear on the set. I look hideous. No, no. Did you do this on purpose? No, why would it? Kidding me? One of the worst pranks involves Shatner again yelling at people to turn off their phones on set, until, at one point, his phone goes off while he's tied up for a scene, causing him to get even angrier. Whose phone is that? Cut, 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 cut. Whose phone is that? Whose phone is that? I think it's yours. That what? It's yours. The show then cuts to Brooke Lemke, who is an actress from Riverside who thinks that this movie is going to be her first big acting gig as a leading lady, who is clearly uneasy with the situation. Brooke is later interviewed for what she thinks are behind the scenes videos, where she says how fantastic Shatner was to work with, as the show then intercuts her interview with her being clearly uncomfortable on set with Shatner. Get me out of this thing. Working with Bill was much more relaxing than what I thought it was going to be. Whose fault is that? Whose phone is that? He's been very pleasant to be with. Isn't it funny watching an actress feel uncomfortable and unsafe working on a film set because the director, a powerful man, is acting out, but she can't say anything because of the explicit power difference? Isn't that just hysterical? I mean, it is hysterical because woman, but... Ha! That's etymology humor. <laughs> It gets even more uncomfortable when you see the actors who were saying nice things about working with Shatner before the prank was revealed, then say that they thought it was ridiculous and that they were uncomfortable after they know it's safe to say anything negative once the prank is revealed. Well, I was gonna pull out after the first day. <laughs> <laughs> but all this still isn't even the worst of it. At one point, Kirk Ward strips almost naked with the intent to make the Riverside actors uncomfortable. Kirk Ward also intentionally wears tight pants and even accidentally exposes himself at one point during a baseball game in front of the cast. There's also a time that Shatner has his assistant reach into his pocket so we can all laugh at how his hand is close to Shatner's junk and how uncomfortable that makes Shatner's Riverside cast. Isn't laughing at borderline sexual harassment in the workplace funny? It gets even more uncomfortable when Brooke has to perform a scene where her character asks Shatner to sleep with her. If I'm already pregnant, I can't become pregnant. I don't understand. Shane, this is hard for me to say. There aren't a lot of men around here. As if it's funny that you have an actress tricked into performing a scene for a film that isn't even real, where she then has to hit on the director in charge, who she thinks holds her career in his hands. She's very young, William. I know, I, we were talking about that. I, I hope it's gonna be all right. I, I'm sure it is. I'm sure it is, you're all right. Brooke, and you know, she, he's old enough to be her grandfather, and she's this 22 year old non-actor. Not to mention that the entire fake script's premise is that an alien emperor wants to impregnate Brooke's character. She's been sent to take you back to the emperor for your impregnation. 
What's frustrating about all of this is that it's actually mild compared to the real life abuses that we see on actual film sets. Actors, and especially women on film sets and in Hollywood, have constantly been forced into sexually exploitative situations and been unable to say anything for fear of losing not only their jobs, but their entire careers. Just look at Harvey Weinstein using his power over women to sexually harass and rape them. Russell Brand allegedly harassed women on the set of his movies. And these are only the men who have rightfully been publicly derided. And even then, many are often still allowed to continue their careers. More often, abuse gets completely ignored. Or even when it is noticed, it's played off in the name of art. Sharon Stone was tricked into not wearing underwear for her scene in Basic Instinct, and not told that her genitals would be shown in the film itself. Yet the movie was praised at the time for this shocking moment of supposed feminine manipulation, which only occurred due to the exploitation of its lead actress. To this day, Stanley Kubrick's film The Shining is praised as a masterpiece despite his endless emotional abuse of Shelley Duvall on set. And all of these are not isolated incidents, but an industry-wide problem that we see over and over and over again. We constantly hear stories of famous directors and actors yelling at crew members, creating situations where no one can speak up despite the uncomfortable situation because no one wants to lose their job. We are creating thousands of jobs, you I don't ever want to see it again, ever. And if you don't do it, you're fired. And if I see you do it again, you're gone. And just to be clear, by the way, while disproportionately more marginalized people suffer, it's not just marginalized people. Mia Goth allegedly kicked a male extra in the head on the set of her upcoming film, Maxine. And then, according to the man's lawsuit, she, quote, taunted, mocked, and belittled him, daring him to do anything about it. Goth, again allegedly, did that because she knew that her celebrity and power could intimidate the man into possibly staying silent about his abuse. As well as the shame that a man would feel for coming forward about being abused. Because it would again make him seem like less of a man. Playing into the power dynamics of our society. And these are all flagrant abuses of power. But there are even times where directors use their power to create incredibly controlling set environments. Such as how Robert Downey Jr. talked about how Christopher Nolan on the set of Oppenheimer would pressure actors into not using the bathroom the entire time on set. A story that Kelly and Murphy also corroborated. And he doesn't even really like it when you go to the bathroom, but he understands you have to. Yeah. And I asked him, dude, when do you go? And he goes, 11 a.m. and 6 p.m. <laughs> and I was like, are you, are you fucking with and me? And he drinks so much tea. I know, but it's not, not right a diuretic tea. No, it's not. Both well, actors play this behavior off as humorous, but it is deeply concerning. Especially if you consider that there are many people who have bathroom related issues who may feel pressured to not care for their medical needs on a set with no one. Like lack of chairs, is that a real thing? I mean, there's an apple box around now. Occasionally there's an Just apple park, box. Just park your booty on an apple box. Human resources are scarce. <laughs> <laughs> It makes me wonder if caring for the safety and needs of his cast and crew, or taking time to make sure disabled people are able to work on his set, is considered wasted time on a Christopher Nolan film. Chris, from all the films he's done, he deplores waste. Yes. He is a conservationist of the highest order. Or is it probable that Nolan doesn't hire many marginalized folks because it's considered a distraction on his set? Or he considers it taking away from them the professionalism of the job? Something that Hollywood never talks about because Nolan is consistently praised as this amazing director who we all need to venerate, and his perfectionist style is seen as admirable. Every single person has come to set knowing that they have been hired because somewhere along the line, Chris thought that you did a good job. And this goes for crew as well. While all those lower in the hierarchy are seen as needing to suffer or be pushed aside to accommodate greatness, the needs or protection of the marginalized is vilified. Take intimacy coordinators on film sets. A role that's gaining prominence in Hollywood on sets nowadays, which is akin to stunt coordinators for intimate scenes in order to make everyone feel comfortable and safe. There is an active disdain pervasive throughout Hollywood for that role that we can even see in shows like The Idol, where an intimacy coordinator, played by the fantastic trans man actor Scott Turner Schofield, was locked in a bathroom for doing his job. Bathroom. It's a very big bathroom. Please. Fucking what are you Play doing? Some fucking hey, hey! The show depicts intimacy coordinators as over-worried bureaucrats who get in the way of artists trying to do their earnest work, rather than what they actually are. Someone there to ensure the safety and comfortability of the actor so that abuse doesn't occur. If you want to show your body, which would be great, we have to change the nudity writer. Okay, so let's fucking change the nudity writer. It uh, takes at least 48 hours. Okay, so I'm not allowed to show my body? Not in the general, like, 
human rights structure of it all. But this is reflective of how many in Hollywood view intimacy coordinators. I think the natural way lovers behave would be ruined by someone bringing it right down to a technical exercise. It would inhibit me more because it's drawing attention to things. All this is why we see these abuses happening over and over and over again. Because we tell stories of great artists and powerful men who we all must accommodate and venerate. Anyone beneath them, especially those seen as other or vulnerable to abuses within a system never set up to enable their success, are ignored or seen as getting in the way of said greatness. Recently, I filmed my own sci-fi movie, Identities, that's coming out in a little bit. And for the film, we had a crew of mostly LGBTQ folks and women. And what shocked me most as a director was how many of my cast and crew were shocked that they didn't have to work on a set where they were treated like cogs in a machine or yelled at. And that's not me trying to venerate myself and say, oh, look at me, I'm a great director, but more me saying that I'm shocked that the way that I treated people wasn't the norm. I'm shocked by how much mistreatment marginalized people have grown accustomed to in the film industry and don't speak up about because to do so would be seen as disruptive and a distraction rather than something to be listened to because it means that they wouldn't be hired. That the norm is so far below the bare minimum of reasonable treatment of any human being regardless of the context. Instead of dealing with how marginalized people are treated and seeing them as humans, they're often not hired. So studios and producers don't have to deal with the problems that they cause. This isn't even to discuss the fact that our stories are never even being told by Hollywood and we're often just the friend off to the side or the tokenistic transgender Barbie. And never mind the shit that I'm gonna have to deal with with someone who wants to become a director in a Hollywood system that values factory line directors and writers who pump out predetermined franchise installments rather than earnest art. We are told to reach for the stars, to reach for greatness. Yet our stories, our art, our very lives will never be valued as great by a culture with a vested interest in upholding a system of structural power built on oppression and exploitation reliant on the denial of personhood. We will never be seen as great, our stories fading into darkness. Instead, like the women of Shatner's crew or the people of Riverside, Iowa, we become props in someone else's story. The situations that Shatner, Wyatt, and Reese create on Invasion Iowa are mild compared to actual abuse situations that we see on real sets. However, they have explicit awareness that what they're doing is inappropriate, but they still create that environment nonetheless to construct a scenario where we laugh at those made to suffer it. The joke is predicated on seeing abusive work environments as funny. Invasion Iowa is a show that could only have been made in that specific era around 2005. As its humor is tasteless, but it also emphasizes, even if unintentionally, how much we still don't want to look directly at these types of abuses even today. Our awareness oftentimes only comes in casual dismissal, or we are asked to empathize with the abuser in the situation. I'm looking at you, Johnny Depp. Or worse, through our veneration of celebrity, we celebrate its usage. And this is the same celebrity that Shatner willingly wields to intentionally create fake art and laugh at those pressured to say nothing. And it's in that silence that abuses continue to occur. There's a strange fetishization of Riverside life throughout Invasion Iowa, even amidst its condescension. The people of Riverside are constantly positioned as the other within the viewpoint of the show. You can see it in subtle things, such as how the lower thirds for the townspeople are an American flag versus the Hollywood crew getting outer space lower thirds. But you also hear things like the cast praising the fundamental real humanity of the people of Riverside, Iowa. As a church secretary and a farmer's wife, I brought new visitors a homemade apple pie that I baked this morning. My eyes rolled back in my head, not just at the taste, which was phenomenal, because it was homemade, because of the implication. Baked a pie. That is so Iowa. I cannot believe it. This feeling echoes these concepts that we constantly hear about this area being the real heart of America. How if you leave the cities of our country, you'll be able to find the true beating heart and soul of what America is. But the truth is, the only reason that it feels real is because we have so disconnected ourselves from each other. So when we see communities like this, we're shocked. But in truth, we're denying ourselves a connection to see humanity. We're dehumanizing ourselves. 
And it's from this distance that bigotry's resentments and hatreds can get generated by those in power. But in the moments where we break through that, and we actually truly see each other as full people, the power of that is undeniable. On the final day, we can see Shatner and company wrestle with their fear over revealing the prank, as if they're finally aware, faced with having to tell the truth, that what they've done might not be okay. We found them loving and open and direct and willing to give of themselves to us. Yes, I'm going to apologize. Yes, I'm going to say we played this joke on you, but it was well meant and will be presented well meant. Early in the show, there was a comical scene where the guru gets everyone to love bomb each other, yelling over the top compliments at each other in a way that we're meant to see as humorous. I love that cute little nose! Love bomb! <laughs> but this bothers me in two ways. One, these compliments are earnest and kind and sweet. And two, because love bombing is an actual term used to describe abusive and controlling behavior in relationships. Abusers will charm their victim, showering them with gifts and kind words, often at the start of a relationship, in order to seek premature commitment and affection, but then get annoyed when their victim attempts to put up boundaries or express themselves. This is when they use their prior and continual over-affection to deny the victim self-worth. So hearing it thrown around in this scene is uncomfortable, Yet what's more uncomfortable is how that exact type of abusive behavior is basically how Shatner and company reveal the movie is a fake. Everyone, and I mean this from the bottom of my heart, love bomb! Love bomb. <laughs> Thank you for having us so much. Yes. I gotta love bomb everybody, the town people, people of our area, and all you people that accepted us as much as we accepted you. They take the Riverside residents to a nice dinner where, after playing one final prank where the producer says the film is off, Shatner comes clean. There's no movie, but there is a television show. This is a reality television show. Everything in front of and behind the cameras was fake for comedy. Shatner and the fake crew then all share how much they genuinely love the cast as Scotty starts to cry causing others to cry as well. Meanwhile, Shatner starts unveiling gifts to each of the prank victims. Scotty gets the trip that he and his wife always wanted, Brooke has her horse paid for for an entire year, and Diana is given enough money to help her legally adopt her grandson. And it said that it hoped that this would help towards the adoption of my grandson, and it definitely will. And truly, I'm so happy that good things come to these wonderful people. They all deserve it. But it doesn't erase the emotional stress Wyatt Reese and Shatner put them through, or the lies that they told them. Brooke may have her horse paid for, but her big break into Hollywood is not happening here. It never was going to have a chance to happen here. Ultimately, by giving gifts, Shatner and the crew are attempting to absolve their guilt, generating heightened positive emotions upon the reveal to deny the Riverside citizens' ability to properly emotionally process the maliciousness. And we fell in love with you guys in the same way you fell in love with us. The producers had tried something similar on The Joe Schmo Show, paying Matt the promised $100,000 at the end of the series. Yet, this money didn't heal the mental harm that they had done to Matt on the show, as he lived in fear of the people who saw the show mocking him for expressing his emotions, as the show itself had done. That would lead Matt to developing depression and a drug problem that would take him several years to work through. I was so embarrassed about the whole premise of the show that I never wanted people to think, oh, here's this guy who didn't even know the show was about him, it's a big joke, and now he's some reality star trying to be a TV host. So I holed up in an apartment in Santa Monica and spent a lot of the money on marijuana and alcohol. Now I'm married with a new baby and a stepson. I work at a logistics company. Were things different, I would much rather be working in the entertainment business. This sadly is not unique to Matt's experience. I personally know so many people who had beautiful stories that they wanted to tell in Hollywood who left disillusioned with the dream of filmmaking forever because of the abuse and structural barriers they encountered simply for who they are. This abuse denied them their dream, but also us from being able to hear their stories to see their way of viewing the world through their own unique perspective. Instead, 
We just hear the same stories over and over and over again. Matt, like so many people who have been abused by this industry, left it never to come back, never able to tell the stories that he was inspired to tell by coming to Hollywood in the first place. This harm can even happen in more compassionate settings. Ronald Gladden of Jury Duty spoke about how it took him months to truly come to terms with the reality of what happened to him. The cast and crew being so supportive right after the reveal led to him not even being able to have a chance to get mad or process everything. But I'm not kidding, months and months down the road after this, I was still getting hit with things like, oh wow, was that staged? Was that fake? Was that an actor? It took months for me to come to the realization that this actually happened and to accept it. Humans are empathetic creatures. We invest our emotions into the people and situations around us. Our connections to what is happening are what makes it real to us. As Judith Butler said, performance makes reality. So to find out that it was fake, that your emotions were manipulated by people with power over you who changed your reality is difficult for anyone to process, even more so when it's done maliciously. All this is why, even in the best of circumstances like jury duty, shows like this are ethically questionable and can lead to real emotional strain. And Invasion Iowa was not the best of circumstances. And we can see this laid bare when Wayne has none of it. Clearly not caught up in the love bombing. Wayne, I'm pretty hurt and pissed off. Tell you, you? I just hope you guys don't make a monkey out of us, oh, and God, I think that's no. what you're doing. Nobody in all your innate dignity did make a monkey of themselves, nor will we ever, ever do anything to make you. You're the best. I meant every word of that whenever I spoke about you, and I would, it would hurt me for a long time to come if I felt that you held on to those feelings. Wayne causes the cast to doubt if they did the right thing. When Wayne left, I thought, oh man, this is really bad. I thought he was gonna go into town and tell people just because he was so upset. If Wayne Simon is one person that's mad out of these people, what if there's a hundred Wayne Simons that are like, you lied to me. That is until Wayne shows up at the party that night where they were going to reveal the deception to the entire town of Riverside, thus giving the cast a feeling of absolution. Wayne showed up and he was happy. I was like, okay, Wayne's probably the biggest, strongest guy in town. He's on our side. I'm like, okay, we're okay. However, Wayne never says he forgives anyone. He only expresses relief that the town itself took the reveal well underscoring his concern for his community's well-being. The reaction I can see that looks like the town took it okay. But none of the cast and crew of Riverside, at least as far as we see, bother to actually check in with Wayne. They only seek a clear conscience and get it. Even the town's emotions are manipulated when Shatner donates $100,000 to them. A check hiding the truth. That money does not erase harm, nor is gift giving accepting accountability for abuse of power and trust. To this day, Shatner still has a cult of personality. When I tweeted regarding Shatner's thin skin concerning the Star Trek banner, folks came up to call him a true alpha or the king of Star Trek. People hero worshiping him because of the work that he did as an artist that meant something to each of them. Yet it's this reference that isolates Shatner. He had his line, he was like a couple of tables down from me of, you know, 300 people. And he's signing, he's signing over and over being super nice. And, and then he goes to the green room. I watch him leave and go backstage with the green room. And by the time I get to the green room, he has a lineup of people in the green room who are waiting to talk to him. So imagine what this guy's life is like. He leaves uh, 500 fans goes to the back and he has, you know, 20 people waiting, literally waiting in a line to have a conversation with him where he's supposed to be relaxing. Uh, so you kind of get it that when he meets me, I have to remind him who I am. I've been extremely critical of Shatner this whole video, but his self-importance is motivated by our culture of idolization and hierarchical systems that has been put in place to incentivize this building sense of superiority in each of us. Invasion Iowa, in a weird way, plays into this, with so much of the show seemingly trying to play up how kind and nice Shatner is. To say that despite his ego, which really is just a joke, he's actually very sweet, even as the show he is within is mocking those complimenting him. 
This is not to absolve Shatner of the abuse of that power, but to understand him in the precarious place that he exists within. How could a person who has spent a large part of his life being constantly isolated from those who see him as someone to uplift ever be truly able to relate to others without some level of power imbalance? I had several people reach out to me when they heard I was doing this video who have worked with Shatner, and all were quick to compliment him. Their stories painted a picture of a sweet, kind man, which I'm sure is true. Yet, I also took note that the people who reached out to compliment him were men who are working with him in a position of professional respect, often those with power, like a producer, director, or writer. Conversely, Shatner has been known for ableism, transphobia, racism, and homophobia. Wait, what do you think he wants from you? Uh, I, I, I don't think I can tell you on the air. <laughs> 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 you know, beep. Beep. He wants my beep. Uh, some, some of those episodes with the shirt off. Yeah. Often not coming from overt bigotry, but his lack of curiosity or care at hearing anyone's perspectives but his own, or those he respects, which are often never people in the lesser power dynamic position than him. Take, for example, Shatner's lifelong feud with George Takei. Shatner always describes Takei as this guy that he barely knew on set, despite working with him in productions for over four decades and even directing him in Star Trek V. Shatner continually expresses bewilderment and hurt that Takei would hold a grudge against him. So I didn't know. I literally didn't know. The six movies we made were a couple of years apart. Again, come in, hello George, family. I didn't know. I had no interaction with him whatsoever. In the last 50 years, the man has blackened my reputation. Why, why, why would one person in this large audience have a bad opinion of me because of George Takei? It makes me, it upsets me. So I don't, I'm not burying any hatchet. I don't have any animus towards him. I don't know who he is. But perhaps it is this exact lack of curiosity or consideration for how Takei felt on a set where Shatner was the leading man, the position that so often sets the tone for the other actors, that led to Shatner perpetuating self-centered behavior that caused Takei's resentment. On the script, the uh, dialogue is me talking and the captain listening. And of course, the director setting up the scene uh, on me. He comes on the set and he sees that and then he takes the director off to the side and they have whispered conversation. The director comes back and the camera is now on Bill. His reaction to what I'm saying is the more important thing. And you know, maybe he's right once or maybe even twice but it happens consistently. A few years ago, I made a video talking about William Shatner calling the word cisgender a slur, where I tried to explain that the only reason he saw cisgender as a slur came from his lack of engagement with trans people, thus not seeing the word in everyday usage. Some people, and I assume William Shatner is one of these, just don't hang out with or know a ton of trans people, and so they never really encounter the term cisgender in passing. And I know that he or his social media manager saw this video because I was blocked very soon after. Instead of engaging with earnest criticism, he instead shut himself off. His isolation leads to a lack of engagement with those outside of his worldview and thus dehumanizing us. And this is not just something solely done to him. I mean, hell, look at someone like JK Rowling for a very similar arc. Shatner was and is a product of systems meant to continually create men just like him. He was the leading man, told he was great, and he acted accordingly, not just as the most important character, but the most important person. Two things that became one as the lines between reality and fiction became blurred by the tales of great men our society constantly tells us to believe in, in our stories and in our real life. Speaking of, I don't want to put all of Invasion Iowa solely on Shatner. He didn't edit the show or even come up with the concept. In fact, there have been moments that feel like there have been genuine bonding between Shatner and his crew with the people of Riverside, like when they play a baseball game together. You only got one more strike, but don't tense up. Be quiet! <sighs> what are you talking about? I got an Emmy. You can't tell me to be quiet. All right, you got to dig it. Ooh, yes, red, red, red. But these moments feel hollow, given the overall mocking tone of the series. These brief glimpses of connection read more like the producers intentionally trying to recreate the arc of the Joe Schmo show, but in a more perverse way, because it's done with calculation to create an artificial, cynical narrative rather than one built on true empathy. Thus, there are no real relationships capable of being formed here. 
and that's directly on the producers, even if Shatner came into this series with the best of intentions to uplift these folks rather than put them down. That is exactly how Shatner and the producers are capable of creating work like Invasion Iowa. It's why directors, actors, and producers on set are able to mistreat those they see as their lessers. And it's these exact power hierarchies that our society intentionally creates that enable the powerful to see others as objects to exploit rather than full people. I never felt vulnerable to like the producers and stuff like that. Like I had so much freaking trust in them that they never <laughs> violated. Sucker. That I and this thought never even occurred to me. Like. Oh, they made me feel so comfortable throughout the week. Little did I know those fucking assholes were doing now. Um, Welcome to Hollywood, Mr. Yeah, Gold. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. For comparison, Ronald of Jury Duty still hangs out with the show's cast. But do you think anyone from Invasion Iowa wants to hang out with William Shatner? Or perhaps the more meaningful question is, would Shatner want to hang out with anyone from Riverside, Iowa again? There is one moment to me that encapsulates the entirety of Invasion Iowa. Throughout the show, Shatner has befriended Don Rath, an older man. Their interactions are sweet and earnest, as Rath seems humbly gracious that Shatner takes time with him, a lowly townsman. It was really great to meet William Shatner, <laughs> just like uh, you were talking to your next door neighbor. This friendship was instigated because Shatner found it funny that Rath carried around a raccoon's penis bone for good luck. But despite Shatner's superficial reasons for befriending Don, on their final meeting, Don reveals how truly touched he is to have met Shatner. Thinking it's the last time that they'll see each other, Don gives Shatner a mug made by his late wife, one of the few that he has left. And at first I thought, there's no way I can take this. And then I looked into his eyes and I realized there was no way I couldn't accept it. Shatner, shocked, is genuinely thankful, prompting Don to ask him a favor. Don then takes Shatner to the gravestone of his late wife in the most heartfelt moment of the entire show. I'm overwhelmed by your sharing this with me, and I thank you for that, and I respect you for it. I wish he was here to see it. You can see here how truly touched Shatner is by this unexpected gesture of vulnerability and goodwill. It's a moment of pure connection, of pure humanity. But Shatner is also aware that Don is oblivious to the truth of the situation, the assumptions and caricature of Don's town and the kind of person Don was that Shatner had seldom questioned before this. For a brief, moment, Shatner is forced to reckon with the full scope of the reality he created. How Don's moment of earnest human connection has been tainted by Shatner's choice to abuse Don's trust before Shatner had even taken the chance to know him. It reminds me of another, more recent televised moment with William Shatner, when, a few years ago, Jeff Bezos paid for him to go to space, where Shatner got to see the curve of the Earth. Upon returning to our planet, you can see Shatner experience the overview effect, that feeling of intense identification with all humanity after being forced to see how we're all just blips floating on a giant ball through the endless void. How all we really have is each other. Breaking through this little thin blue skin that is, surrounds Earth and provides us with life broke through and all of a sudden the blue is down below and the blackness of space in that big window it was only black and ominous and that was death and this was life and everything else just stood still for a moment i was overwhelmed with the experience with it with the sensation of looking at death and looking at life but shatner's moment of genuine reflection is shattered by Jeff Bezos popping open champagne. <laughs> that moment destroyed by the very reason that got him there in the first place, a marketing sham where Bezos used Shatner to venerate Bezos' ego. He got to be the man to put Captain Kirk into space. 
a sham that ignores the uncountable exploitations of labor, abuse of workers, and the cult of personality created in order to give Bezos the power to go to space in the first place. I also I want to thank uh, every Amazon employee and every Amazon customer, because you guys paid for all of this. Over a decade earlier, what Bezos did to him, Shatner did to Don Rath, taking this moment of authentic beauty and turning it into a farce. By failing to follow his own humanity and reveal those of others in his art, Shatner denied himself the ability to ever have a moment of true grace in his later years. Our culture loves to dehumanize the plights of others, in our entertainment and everywhere else. Hell, this isn't even stopped in reality shows. Take Squid Game's The Challenge, another reality game show built on ignoring the anti-capitalist themes of the show on which it was based. A show whose whole message was to seek empathy, not division, despite the systems that you're placed within telling you to do otherwise. Squid Game's The Challenge abused its contestants, faked results to get even more sensationalized drama, and, most importantly, refused to see the cruelty at its heart. The viewpoint of Squid Game's The Challenge is that of the decadent aristocracy of the fictional show, laughing at the underclass fighting for their lives, their ability to pay their bills, their college tuition, and more. But that's not even isolated to reality TV. This is the viewpoint through which we are constantly asked to view each other, even in our everyday lives. By news media, by fictional stories, by capitalism, and by the systems of power that we live beneath. We're supposed to see each other as enemies for resources or labor to exploit all in order to make ourselves feel superior. So much of the final episode of Invasion Iowa is Shatner promising the people of Riverside that he wasn't there to make fun of them. He, Wyatt, and Reese had come to know them, he said, and they fell in love with them. But in there is, uh, are people. Looking at people and seeing people. And that's gonna connect us, and that's gonna be tough. Then they went home and made this show that repeatedly mocked, belittled, and ridiculed them and they released it to an audience of millions. There was this moment for me that I had working on identities. For months, I had been working mainly in Zoom calls with one or two people in pre-production, hiring folks and having meetings. And then we finally had one meeting with everyone that we had been working with. And I entered the call and saw almost 20 faces staring back at me, all waiting for me. I'm not a fan of hierarchical structures. So I realized at that moment that my role as director was now to trust that I had picked the people who understood what we wanted to do with the movie, that they were their own artists and creatives, full people with their own brilliant ideas. My job was to guide their artistry, make sure it fit in with everyone else's, and ensure the final film uplifted everyone's work. I was responsible for ensuring everyone could be the best artist, the best person that they could be. And you can't do that when you create abusive conditions. You can't do that if you twist the trust that these artists give you. It's a testament to how good Brooke and everyone else from Riverside were that they gave decent performances in something that was meant to mock them. But they never should have had to. They never should have had their trust abused. Some good came out of Invasion Iowa. After nearly 10 years of being tied up in government financial mismanagement, Shatner's 10K was used to build a Star Trek evoking community center in Riverside. The bench that Shatner bought for John Rath in honor of his late wife still stands there, even though Rath himself is now gone. Brooke Lemke, citing Invasion Iowa as what invoked her passion, went to Los Angeles to pursue a career in acting. She then formed Silent But Deadly Productions in Minneapolis a few years later, where she co-produced, wrote, starred, and acted in several films. SBD Productions also made a film with 75% women, and also tried to provide internships for women and gave teenage girls chances to shadow experienced professionals on actual movies. The last update that I found for SBD Productions was in 2014, and it appears that it no longer exists. But still, Brooke Lemke made art from her heart and cultivated a nurturing creative space. She tried to create connections to herself and uplift others. Ultimately, Invasion Iowa forces us to ask this question. If, as Judith Butler says, our reality is made by what we perform, then what does it say that we create performances based on power and dehumanization? Where within that can actual connection happen? Maybe, 
It occurs in the moments where our constructed realities, our fictions of power and control, break down. Somewhere in that membrane between worlds, between the binaries we mistake as reality and fiction, lies humanity. The line between what I really mean and where I had to lie but I really meant it was very fine. I walked a very fine line between loving these people. So where the lie was and where the truth was, was hidden from me at times as well as from them. Invasion Iowa reveals the cynicism our society wants us to view each other with. The dehumanization we are told is acceptable through our cults of power, money, and celebrity. Through the series Disdain for Others, the show unconsciously laid bare the painful truths that we look away from, and the humanity we often intentionally ignore. Yet it showed that even when we don't expect to find it, or even want to see it, humanity is there nonetheless. Alrighty, everybody, thank you so much for watching this video. This one was a very unexpected one, considering that uh, Aranok and I just thought we were gonna make a frivolous little video, but uh, became something much more, so I hope you enjoyed this look at a mid-2000 show that everyone forgot, as well they probably should have. That being said, I want to let you know that Aranok and I did film ourselves watching the entirety of Invasion Iowa uh, for the initial version of the video that we thought we were going to use. So if you actually want to see us just go off on this show in greater detail and try to make jokes and make fun at it as, as we also get more and more bothered by it, an edited version of the highlights of that is available over on my Patreon. <laughs> oh, look at the effects. Oh my god, the effects. My name is William Shatner. More like William Shitner. <laughs> I'm tired, Jesse. <laughs> I do want to say thank you to all of you who are already my patrons because it really does mean a lot to me. Patreon is how I'm able to pay my bills and pay my collaborators like Aranok. And I will say there has been some stuff that I won't get into that has just been a few bills extra lately. So if you can uh, consider supporting me over on Patreon, it really does mean a lot. And it does go to things like making cool videos. And also I like to say you get yourself perks as well. You get your name in videos. You get access to cool like side stuff like this. I have a podcast about Star Trek Enterprise on there if you're a Trekkie. Uh, so please consider supporting me over on Patreon if you have the ability. But beyond all of that, don't forget to subscribe to this channel. Go subscribe to Aranok's channel as well because Aranok is literally the best. Um, but beyond all of that, I hope you all, my friends, live long and prosper and don't forget what Star Trek is really about. I thanked my patrons last night, pre-flight, zero hour, 9 a.m. And they make me as high as a kite by then. I thank them so much. I thank them as a wife. Love you. Thank you for supporting me. I adore you all. Here's your wonderful names. Joe Herman Hold, Carrie Ellen Foss, Niels Osborne Odzenholm, Art Classer, Barbie Ann Rounds, Sarah Montgomery, Jack McCallan, Stephen Kleinard, Hannah Friedrich, Christian Hurst, Jazz Miss, Randy Thompson, Samuel Howard, Quite Bearish, Marshall Nye, Rose Conley, Eltan Tivy, Courtney Ray Kelly, Dark Archon, Auntie Kate 808, Tara Rose, Lily Blainley, Vincent Ellington, Amada Kaiba, Marina Kaitel, Zane Schusler, Michael Woolnitz, Matt Chung, Alex Miller, Nia 
Vanessa Mayer, Super Desi, Spooky Heather, Sylvia, Todd Verling, Meadow Whisperer, Joseph Dewey, Semi Joe, Retro, Gem Shin, Iron, Chris Showers, Lily Gray, Angela Hendricks, Joelle Gilry, Luna, James Krivda, Shep Alderson, Dominic Noble, Weirdy Beardy, Kaylee Lang, Sonia Nero Perdo, Nathan Froughton, Farangato, Quattro, Ryan Hunter, Breath George Holstrom, W. Randy Eady, Sean Sullivan, Kevin Freitag, Sergeant Bradshaw, Epsilon is greater than Fly and Kata, Bob Saget, Verdux Kai, Troy Stull, Blue. Craig and David, Teague Wilson, Scott Russell, Stephen Richardson, John Witherby, Britz Krieg, Carry On, Casual Observer, K List, Patricia Cromptick, Jess Johnson, Kurt Mullen, Prince of Void, Sarah Lemero, Jason Knott, Teresa Bailey, Joe and the Wretch Witch, Hope, Jason Tuliana, Ruben Gines, Shield Maiden 4444, Elizabeth Tristenson, The Mighty Jinjo Joe, Beatrix Purvis, Matthew Craiglow, Roy Negby, Grumpy Dragon 75, Emma Ramirez, Melody Ann Winters Good, Sasha M, Damian Rice, Valerie Blackbird, Melinda Walters, Kylara Aurora, Sean Piper, Mark H. Williams Author, Jade Persuades, Mark H. Williams author Adam Smatcher, Jade's Persuades, David Demma, Tyler Edwards, Sarah Leslie Hutchkins, Blueberry Hill, Sarah Bystam, Teresa, Doherty Lucero, Laura Demero, Penal Sparing Vaginoplasty, Celestial Dawn, DM Collins, Tori Perez, Caroline Clark, Crit Max, Lev Goodwin, Nye Fan, Callum McLeod of Clan McLeod, Michael Weber, Lou Toussaint, Henry Pierce, Tom G311, Julie Werner, and Chai Cat Midnight Sky. Mwah. Love you all. Adore you all. Sorry I couldn't do it all as William Shatner, but timing and everything. But adore you and thank you, patrons, for making all of this possible. I love you so much.